Are you always coming up with ideas? Do you marvel at successful business owners? Do you hate being told what to do? Ever take things apart just to see how they work? Are you a dreamer? If you've answered yes to any of these questions, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the Entrepreneurial Enclave with Kevin Wortham. The podcast that focuses on building, maintaining, pivoting, planning, and investing in you, the entrepreneur. But first, a word from our sponsor. Tapes' Specialties is the world leader in tape manufacturing and specialty conversion with over 40 years of experience. In addition to our pro brand of high-quality specialty adhesive tapes, we provide contract converting services that help improve your profitability, streamline your supply chain, and reduce inventory cost. We offer the most complete range of converting capabilities in the industry, such as... Cloth tape, double coated tape, specialty tape, paper tape, masking tape, vinyl tape, carton sealing tape, adhesive transfer tape, duct tape, phone tape, electrical tape, filament tape, foil tape, reflective tape. And the tape just keeps on rolling. Visit us online today at www.protapes.com or call us at 800 345 Pro Tapes, it's just how we roll. All right. All right, welcome, yeah. welcome, welcome to another fantastic episode of the Entrepreneurial Enclave, Life's Coming Attraction. I am your host, Kevin Wortham. Today, I am so excited. My dear friend, the Reverend Dr. Alberta Jones has introduced me to this phenomenal woman, the Reverend Dr. Miller. Welcome to the platform, ma'am. How are you, doctor? I am wonderful. How are you today, Mr. Wertham? I am Dr. doing fantastic. <laughs> no, no, not Dr. Wert, not Dr. Oh, Wertham. no, Dr. Yet. No, no, but from your <laughs> list of God's ears, I am working on it. Man, <laughs> just got just to get back in school. That's all. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. I hear and, you. And I'm, and I'm thinking now that you mentioned that, what would I get my PhD in? I think it would probably be either urban studies or entrepreneurship, but that's another that's another story. But here we go. Right. So uh, <laughs> we, we want to give a big shout out to my very dear friend, Alberta, Reverend Dr. Alberta Jones. And uh, as soon as I started this podcast, she says, Kevin, I've got this phenomenal woman that you need to meet and you need to interview. And so when Alberta says she's got someone for me to meet, I make haste to do so. So again, doctor, welcome to the platform. Let's just begin this conversation. Now, I, I understand that you are in the ministry. And mm-hmm. you are over at uh, St. Paul AME. Yes, I am. Say AME Zion. Yes, say, I'm sorry, St. Paul AME Zion. And and what's mm-hmm. and what's interesting? I met your husband first before I met you. And yeah. I, and, I, <laughs> yes. and I was sharing with your husband that that's almost even though I'm Methodist, that's almost like my family church because my father's mother was a member of that church. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes, Novella Clyburn. And and when um, uh, Reverend Tillett, or Dr. Tillett, mm-hmm. first came to Trenton, his, mm-hmm. very, his very first duty was to preach the homegoing service of my grandmother. Oh, wow. Yeah, mm-hmm. so, and I think that might have been over 20, 25, yeah, 25, 20, 25 years ago, I believe. And, wow. And, and since then, I've had other family members. Uh, my, my, I, I, Howard is going to be mad at me, but Howard is my, another family member. I believe he's one of your ushers, Howard Williams. Yes, yes, he is. <laughs> yeah. so he, he, he is so knowledgeable about everybody and everything. So as soon as you tell him, where do you live in Durham, North Carolina, or Smokes, he says, oh, mm-hmm. is that the house that was colored? <laughs> he knows everything. <laughs> And yes, then, he does. <laughs> and then you also know my my dear cousin, uh, Mabel Williams. Yes, yes, definitely. She, she just she just lost her beautiful daughter, my cousin. Yes, yes, I spoke to her yesterday. Oh wow! Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, yes, and, and I'm trying to get her on the podcast as well because uh, at mm-hmm. a at a at a later stage in life, she decided to take her passionate talents of being an artist to the forefront. Mm-hmm. And so I think she yeah. might. I think she might have started her discovery of her passionate coloring and, and water design and artistry 
probably around yes. 60, 65 or 70. Yes, yes. amazing uh, stuff. Amazing. Oh, my yeah. God. So, yes. so even though we have not met, I feel like I know you. So this is going to be a wonderful conversation. So let us let us begin. What what Thank brought, you. First of all, what brought you to the St. Paul AME Church, the AME Zion Church here in Ewing Township? What brought you to that uh, church? Well, um, my bishop is Bishop Dennis Vernon Proctor of the Northeastern Episcopal District, yes. and New Jersey Conference make up, makes up part of that district. He appointed me um, at the beginning of December. I was at Barrack Memorial in Hackensack, New Jersey, and he gave me the appointment to start at the beginning of the year, and that's how I got there, through an appointment through the bishop. Uh, wow. He gave me that um, change and a move, and it was great opportunity and loving every moment of it. Wow. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. So welcome to Mercer County. Welcome to Ewing Township. Now, yes. how did you begin your ministry? Because we, we've got a mm -hmm. now now we've got a lot to impact. And I know some of the story, but I'm going to let you share it because your husband was phenomenal at some point. <laughs> We're going to circle back around and we're going to have the whole, we're going to have the first family podcast because your family is dynamic. And so I know that there is a hidden word as to how you were able to move your family in such a direction. So this is why we've got a mm -hmm. lot to talk about. So, so, yes. so, Doc, we, so we now know how you came into Ewing Township, into Trenton, New Jersey. How did you yes. come into the ministry? Okay. Yes. Well, yes. I um, actually, I grew up in uh, the United Methodist Church up in Patterson, New Jersey. Yes. However, once my husband went in the Navy and we moved, uh, he was stationed in Norfolk, yes. we joined Greater Metropolitan African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, Amy Zion Church down in Norfolk, Virginia. Yes. I began working there doing mostly children's ministry as we had young children at the time. And um, there weren't a lot of youth um, and children workers. So starting off just doing those things and then uh, growing in um, the Young Adult Missionary Society. And um, somewhere along the line, there was, I was at a, um, uh, we had just left an annual conference yes. and we had stopped to get pizza. <laughs> and my husband went inside and I, I, I just heard so clearly, it's time for you to accept your call wow. in that parking lot. And when my husband came out, I said, I'm accepting my call to ministry. And he said, about time. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Doc, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Now, 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 I don't want to make light of that, but what did that, what did that sound like when, when, when God told you? What did that sound like? It, it was just a, uh, a voice in my spirit. It okay. was one of the still small voices. It yes. wasn't nothing like a, 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 a Paul's um, Damascus Road experience, yes. but it was a just that a small voice in my spirit said, it's time. Wow. You have to accept your call to ministry. And I told Jimmy that, went back and told my pastor, who also responded, wow, I was wondering what was taking you so long. Wow. And so, <laughs> wow. so, in, uh, so I preached my um, trial sermon and, uh, the fall of uh, 1998 yes. and have been moving forward um, since then, uh, having the opportunity to serve there at uh, Greater Metropolitan. We then moved up to, um, Jimmy had gotten stationed at the um, Pentagon, so we moved up to uh, Maryland yes. and we joined um, Trinity Amy Zion and it was uh, crazy because one of our former pastors, and actually Jimmy's pastor, uh, father in the ministry, Reverend um, Dr. Joseph Lamb Sr., was the pastor there, and we began serving with him. And that's also at the same time when I began my seminary work at Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology in um, Richmond, Virginia. And when we returned to um, Virginia, and so there I received my, both my, I received first my deacon ordination yes. under Bishop uh, Milton Alexander Sr., then Jimmy got stationed in St. Mary's, Georgia, and received his first appointment to um, uh, Zion Temple in Gainesville, Florida. And so we were down there, and I actually was still up in northern New Jersey with the children because our, our twin sons yes. were um, still in high school. So, But uh, the bishop at that time, Bishop uh, Richard Keith Thompson down there in Florida, Alabama, 
came and said, hey, I need her to come down there with her husband because <laughs> Jimmy was still in the Navy, submarine officer at the time. Yes. And so he was on boomers that went in three months, out three months. And so uh, I, I went down and he um, ordained both Jimmy and I um, elder at the same time at the annual conference. Yes. And I began to support him while he was out to sea. I would I would be there taking care of the church. Eventually, we went back to Norfolk, Virginia, yes. and I went back to uh, Greater Metropolitan um, under Dr. Phil- Felix um, Ofisu, and I got my first appointment in uh, January of 2005. Yes. Uh, the bishop, uh, the pastor told the bishop that that was a dead church and he should close it, and he sent me there. And to find out it was still a, a living church, an yes. am- amazing church, wonderful church. There was work needed to be done. There was uh, death needed to be mitigated. But um, that got me going, and I began that um, that journey there and um, with my first pastorate. And then so I was there for two years, and then Jimmy got sent to California. And then I wound up in California um, <laughs> as I was completing my doctoral degree in higher education, a PhD in higher education, the Old Dominion. Yes. And while there, um, I was introduced to chaplain corps, Navy chaplain corps. Yes. And that was by my husband, who was the command officer of the recruiting district there. Yes. And um, he said, hey, Mel, you know you could be a chaplain. I was like, I am too old. He said, no, we just put in a woman that was 50. So I connected with the recruiters and yes. everyone thing, and they took me out to learn about um, Navy chaplaincy. And um, we went to conference, and I didn't get an appointment. Um, and Jimmy was appointed to Martin Temple AME Zion Church in Compton. Yes. So after that conference, I said, okay, I'm going into the Navy. And it's so the craziest thing to be a chaplain at the age of 46, This at this time I was 46. Yes. And um, – I had to get my age waived, but I had to get all these other waivers. So I was like, they're never going to let me in. God opened every single door. Wow. And so the next thing I know, and I'm a Navy. So I'm still a Navy chaplain. I'm still, I'm pastoring Navy chaplain. However, I'm, I am in the process of separating from the Navy as, um, I, um, and so over the next month or so, I, I probably will be officially out. I'll be off active duty the end of this month. And um, just continuing my 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 um, vocation or my my calling as the pastor of St. Paul, and um, also running for um, I'm a candidate for bishop my church as well. So okay, on on the campaign trail, <laughs> Pastor Doctor, we've got so much to impact unpack. So, <laughs> <wow>. <laughs> See, I knew I knew that this was going to be interesting. So. I heard a lot of names. The first yes. name that I heard was the Reverend Dr. Samuel DeWitt Proctor. Yes. Yes. And I believe he was a graduate of Rutgers University, correct? Yes. And when I was at Rutgers, he was one of the professors. And I yes. believe he, uh, at the time, because he was doing African American studies, and we actually protested when he left there. And it was amazing to have, wind up going to the seminary at Virginia union that is named after him. Wow. So amazing. Yes. Uh, just minister, preacher, evangelist, theologian, yes. everything. And mm-hmm. I've, I've got, a, I've got something extra for you. I don't know if you knew this. They started the very first uh, chartered school uh, in the country down here in, uh, in Trenton and Ewing township. It was the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Academy. Oh wow! It was the yes. first. It was the first uh, charter school with a boarding uh, component, boarding mm-hmm. school component in the country. Did not know that. Yes, and uh, oh and wow! I, 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 met, I can't recall the two young ladies, but mm-hmm. interesting enough, they started the they started the charter school as a joke. Really? They were, oh wow! They were working. <laughs> they were working on. They were both working on their MBA at uh, the, uh-huh. Wharton, the Wharton School of Business. Yes. And they had, yes. and they had to, uh, I guess, put together a, a school project. And so part of the school mm-hmm. project was starting this chartered school. 
but it, wow. it it was it went over so well, it received so well. They says, okay, we've got to make this serious because people love this <laughs> idea, and and that's right. how, and that's how they came about, and they they picked his name because he he was all those things that you had mentioned. You know, yes. he, he was a great doctor. He's African American, yes. Rutgers in New Jersey. So that's how the name came about. Yes, excellent, excellent. Now, now thank you for that. As as you were talking. And all the movement that you and your husband were were doing. Now you're 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 also a mother, right? Oh yes, sir. How, yes, sir. How were you able to minister, ministry, travel, support your husband, and still be a mother? How how did all that happen as well? <laughs> well, <laughs> people ask me that all the time, yeah. and I say I don't think about it. I'm I'm partially insane, probably. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> I won't recognize it enough to go get help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we have um, four children, and yes. we also have a, do- uh, a, 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 a nephew that we have um, guardianship of. They're yes. all grown now. Yes. Um, but yes, I um, being a minister, being a student, being a full-time worker, I've always worked as yes. well. And um, doing all those things, I, I tell you, it's only by the grace of God because— Absolutely. I said, if I really thought about those things as I was doing them, yes. I don't know how many of them I would have done. Yes. But I'm one that is uh, about getting things done. And when I see a need to fulfill the need, um, but also I don't have to do everything. I'm, I'm one who's about mentoring and yes. helping people. So I live by vicariously through a lot of people. Because gotcha. there's just some things I don't have to do, like yes. jumping out of a perfectly good plane. Somebody <laughs> else can do that, and yes. they could tell me how it works. Yes. I don't have to be a doctor. Someone can do that and tell me how it works, yes. you know, and how it's doing. Like my husband being a submariner, I don't need to do that. Yes. Tell me how it is. But I'll help other people to see their visions and their dreams. Yes. And um, so then that gives me the opportunity to experience those things. So for myself, it's about, okay, where do I see the need? Where have I always seen the need? Um, as, as an edu- I'm a lifelong educator. That's, yes. that's just so you see. I also have, um, other than the PhD, I also have a doctor in ministry. So wow. it's all about learning. And I have other professional uh, certificates that I've been working on and about to do another one. But I'm about learning. And education is vital and important. Yes. So I've always made sure that was uh, something I brought out in people that, how they needed to get that education so that they could get to the places that they needed. Yes. But even not just um, talking about college or going to some university, but looking at the opportunities that are available in certificate or apprenticeship programs, yes. uh, CPE type programs, different areas where they can get what they need so that they can be in the place yes. or have the credentials to be able to do what they have. I think everybody has that. Um, the world is everybody's oyster. Very it's just true. that you need people that to support you. And, and that's what I've always had. I've always had people pouring into me to help me to get places. And so um, I don't take that for granted. And so yes. when I see the opportunity, a, a door I can walk into, I walk into it with the hope that if it's not even just for me, yes. that I'm paving the way for someone that else is coming along or alongside me. Yes. So that's, that's always, I think, what has kept me moving and doing. And I've always had my own life. I don't live, like my husband was a uh, submarine officer in the Navy. And a lot of people live their lives through their spouse and their yes. titles. And that's never been me because I need to have uh, who Melanie is. Yes. But having, being able to support him and everything he does, but being able to, to be a role model for my children, for the students that I taught, yes. you know, and so making sure they know if I can do this, they also have the ability to do that. It just, they need to be as their cheerleader. And then for me, those others that have been there to say, okay, yeah, you can do it. We'll support you through it. Yes. And so that's, I think, what's the biggest thing especially now, my husband now, Don, being there every step of the way. Mm-hmm. I've got to ask this question. Now you, you say mm-hmm. Navy chaplain. Yes. Now d- does that mean you were on ships or did you go out to sea? What, 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 yes, what? sir. What? Yes, sir. What? Yes, sir. So <laughs> when I'm, I started in 2009. Yes. Um, in 2009, I went into the chaplain corps, did yes. officer development school up in, Newport, Rhode Island, where I turned 47 yes. while they were yelling at me and had me doing push-ups and jump, jumping jacks in the sand pit. 
but and you, but Michelin you, towers and all kind of crazy wait, but stuff. You, but you're going. You're, you're, you're only you're only going there to pray for people. You don't need to do push ups, do you? Yes, you do, sir. <laughs> you got to be in shape. You got to you got to be. Oh, <laughs> you got to learn how to be an officer. So okay. officer, that was officer development school. Does it develop? Because um, those who are core officers, people who take care of people, yes. go to officer development school as opposed to officer candidate school, yes. which is for the war fighters. Yes. Like my one of my twins went to OCS and my husband. But um, then going to chaplain core school. But you do because my first duty station on active duty was with the United States Marine Corps. Because Navy chaplains serve with Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard. Um, and merchant marines as opposed to army has their own and yes. air force has their own so i served with the marine corps for three years out in 20 29 palms and so yes so you have to be ready because they like to hike so i would go on hikes with them and run with them squadron runs you have to be what? ready and so that you can be the importance of being a chaplain is yes. being yes. that emmanuel presence to be at emmanuel presence amongst the people and so you have to be out there where they are and so being in their spaces, hiking with them, running with them, going out on missions and trainings with them. Um, you go out. It's called deck plate. We call it deck plating, yes. being out there. And that's how you connect. That's why and most of, most of our time is spent counseling, yes. So especially these young people. And so being out there in these areas where they are, they connect with you. And now they know, okay, I could go to her when I need something. And so, yes, so being in shape. And so I spent three years with them in the desert, doing all of these things with <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, with them. And then I got off active duty yes. and um, I was working with Navy Recruiting District in New York. They recruited me back in on um, reserve. <laughs> and so when I came back in the reserves, now I spent most of my time with the Navy. So yes, I've been out to uh, California numerous times on the Harper's Theory yes. and uh, uh, several ships in. And I went out to uh, Japan, Yakuska, Japan, for um, back in 20, um, 19, 18, 20, no, 2019. Yes. And I, 2018, 2019, because it crossed over the holidays. And I was on the USS Seedom, went out in the Southern Sea and um, just spent um, deployment with them wow. out there. And so, yes, I've been on ships. Um, my husband, a submariner, we, I've never gone out with a submarine, but I spent a lot of time because uh, when our children were little, we would take them when my husband had duty and go eat dinner with him and watch yes. a movie on the sub. And so that was really cool. Um, but I got to ride in the back of a Osprey, which was really cool. And then my son, one of my other sons, the other twin, went in the Marine Corps, and he's an Osprey pilot. So it was wow. cool to get on a, a platform that he actually flew. So, yes, I've had a lot of those experiences. Doc, man, you know, this when, when you, I'm, I'm putting the cat out of the bag, though. When your <laughs> husband was telling me all the things that you guys were involved in, <laughs> The first thing I came, I said, oh, you guys are like the religious Cosby family. <laughs> <laughs> because, That's a good analogy. Yes, you know, sir. You know, when, I was, when, I was, when I was growing up, the Cosby show was like, it was cool, but it seemed unreal. Right. But then I had a very dear friend of mine. Uh, his mm -hmm. mother was the first African-American uh, Supreme Court justice in the state of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. and, and his father was a dentist, so almost not like the Cosby's, but right. But but I could relate to the Cosby esque, you know, imagery. And yes, so sir. When your husband was going down the line as to you know what one son was doing, I think he said one son uh, was in uh, was a doctor. Uh, yeah, so he's the yeah. one that was a Navy yes. um, surface warfare officer. The Navy is now sending him. To UVA to be a doctor, yes. a Navy doctor. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you have one, I think a daughter is going to be a veterinarian. She is a veterinarian yes. in the Houston area. Mm -hmm. And then the other twin yes. is um, in law school. He was yes. a, a Marine Corps pilot. Yes. Yep. And I said, yes. yep. and I said, it's like, it's like the spiritual Cosby. I said, this is fantastic. <laughs> but now I've got, I've got greater appreciation for you because you know, when, when, I'm thinking, and, and, and I apologize, I'm thinking, okay, no. she's, a, she's a pastor, but she's also a chaplain. Okay, that means she's sitting at the dock waiting for the boats to come in, and she's having prayer and coffee. I didn't know you were doing all that training. You are so tough. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh my! <laughs> that's, that's what you want to call it. Uh, you, when yes. I showed up at that water tower, I don't know how tough I was, and they said you're going to retell that. I'm like, really? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Heavenly Father, give me wings. <laughs> that's oh, right. That's man. right. <laughs> Yes, that's, oh, that's yeah, oh, and this is why I'm saying at some point we've got to do a family podcast because mm-hmm. th- there is a movement or there was and continues to be a movement of foot as to how God was moving you and your husband just to move your family. Right. So let's. Oh, yes. So, so let's let's yes. break that down. When you guys had a family. Mm-hmm. Wh- why? Why do you think God was calling you to move so much? Hmm. That, that's a that's an excellent question. And, you know, when we look back, because both of us come from what I would say are humble beginnings. Yes. And we have, uh, you come from working parents, my parents um, and his mom, working parents that worked all the time. But um, I grew up number five of six in a two-bedroom house yes. where there was always someone living with us. So that really meant we had a one bedroom. house. Yes. <laughs> and Jimmy grew up in Alabama projects in Patterson. And so when we, uh, we met at Rutgers, even though we were from the same hometown, yes. um, we had to start from there. He was working at Burger King. I was working at Sears when we got married. And then wow. he went into the Navy nine days after we got married and he was enlisted at that time. I still have that. The first, um, LES is pay stuff yes. where he was making $275 every two weeks. Wow. Back then, that was in 83. Wow. And so, but then he, yes. And he got picked up uh, about four years later, yes. three or four years later. And to be, go into listed commissioning where he went to old dominion and got commissioned in as a Navy officer. Yes. So we, we've always had the, we've always worked. And as I, uh, tried to finish uh, Rutgers, but then have started having children. Yes. Then we started moving. I'll tell you one thing. Um, a lot of people look at it as crazy because all of our children, including my nephew now, when we got him, he was 14, and he wound up moving a couple of times after that <laughs> with us. Like, whoa. But, you know, they have always been able to adjust everywhere they've gone. Yes. It's crazy. And it's really allowed them, they've been in, different spheres, different demographics. They've been some of different, different areas. And even um, if they didn't, we would intentionally take them into some areas to get them the opportunity to see that life is different. It's not yes. the same everywhere, every place they go. Yes. And so uh, having that opportunity, even 14, 15, I think my daughter may have the, the record of them where somewhere between 15 to 16 schools over her lifetime um, and the boys at least 14. However, um, they all adjust well. They've all been honor students, all graduated with honors and um, gone to schools, um, the the twins on scholarships, um, Jatim working, uh, you know, and we had GI Bill and my older son, uh, my older son, he works with um, Enterprise. And he does his own thing and very talented in the arts and chefs and stuff like that. Yes. Um, but they've been able to just, and, but it's funny when they all went to college, the twins and my daughter, they said the weirdest thing for them was that they were staying at one place that they were, went to college and they weren't moving anymore, okay. that they were at one school and would follow it through. And they all did follow it through. Yeah. So they, they thought that was the strangest thing, but they wouldn't. When they talk about their experiences, even though they would have probably liked to be somewhere yes. in one place for a while, they 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 think it's the greatest thing that they've had the opportunity to be exposed to so many different things. And I think that's what has helped them to see, because all of them are, they, they try to do advocate work. They try to do uh, social justice work. The yes. twins, both the, in the law school and medical school, the one in medical school is working on programs to get um medical care to to the lesser uh to, to people that need help in yes. parts of Virginia yes. that are underserved and I'm um, working with the schools and then my son that is in law school in Atlanta he's working with a black male initiative project to get more black males uh, uh in, informed about going to law school yes. to increase the number of males 
in that profession. And so he's, uh, they're both doing all this networking, even in the midst of studying and trying to impact the lives of other people. And it. my daughter does the same thing. And her being a veterinarian, people don't, they think it's all about pets, but it's about public health. Yes. So she tells the people, you know, you got to take care of your pets because it does not only impact pets, animals, yes. it impacts the lives of people. So that is at the forefront of her mind when, the, when she's taking care of pets that you have to take care of your pets because we have taking care of our pets, take care of the people. Yes. And if we don't, then we jeopardize our livelihood. Yep. And so uh, those adjustments, I think, um, and with us growing through it and then putting these in, putting them in places of different places has helped them to uh, cultivate these mindsets of how do we um, take care of people? Yes. And that's the bottom line. Now, mm -hmm. now Doc, I've got, mm -hmm. I've got a weird question that I want you to ask. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm asking of you that, to ask of your daughter. So yes. we just had this huge hurricane called Hurricane I, uh, Ian, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, where do those pets go that lose their parents? You know, mm. because a lot of them are separated. So has she had to go yes. down to Florida? Has she seen pets come from Florida? Um, you know, I'll have to ask her. She has not said anything, uh -huh. but pretty much they're probably going to some type of shelters and they're probably having holding places, holding shelters for them. Um, but they also, um, and see, different states do different, and this is one thing she shared with us, different states have different laws on animals yes. and what happens when the animal is out there on its own and has no one. So some will take them to the shelters and then they allow people to come and adopt them. Yes. Some will take them to shelters. They'll give uh, them like 30 days. If no one contacts them, they could wind up in a kill shelter. Oh, no. um, some mm. could wind up going um, to be uh, part of, of, of a veterinarian school so they can look at them and use them to diagnose issues and yes. different things like that. But it depends on the state in the area. Some areas they don't care. I, we lost a dog one time. Um, went to, we were going to Florida, and we left the dog with my brother, and it got loose, and it was in the woods for two weeks, and we were calling the police, and they said, well, you know, if somebody <laughs> finds them, they just have a dog. They had no rules. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but she'll tell you different yes. states have different rules, and so it depends on what Florida yes. has as their rules. And if they are transporting them so that they have a better, another opportunity to go somewhere else and be adopted, hopefully those are the things. But I will ask her that. Because yeah, so. I, I, was, I was just curious because it's like you, you always see where the people go mm -hmm. for support. Well, where do all these pets yes. go for support? They've been, <laughs> yes. se they've been separated from their owners, from their, their, dog, their, yes. their, their, their dog parents, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, so yeah. they probably have some shelters specially set up for yeah. them. But there are like time limitations and things that may be connected. And then, mm -hmm. and then my, my other my other thought is like in, in you're you're raising your your two wonderful sons. I mean I mean your your your, your three wonderful sons and your and your and your nephew. But going mm -hmm. specifically to your son, your sons, what did you instill in your sons for them to have this level of uh, of advocacy, right? For wanting them to go mm -hmm. back and reach back. How, and to deal with some of the trauma because they, they didn't have to. So what were you instilling? Right. What were you and your husband instilling in them? Right. I, I think it's just um, role modeling. Okay. I think they just seen that uh, over the years, that's just what we've been doing, um, reaching out and just touching people and doing things for people, giving people opportunities, um, both of us coaching, yes. taking care of uh, young people. And, you know, I was a teacher and a, 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 yes, back, yes. a, a cheerleading coach at one time. <laughs> and, you know, picking up, giving people rides that especially, um, it, you know, I had, um, we have, I have a sleepover for my children. I said, I can't do that now. They probably arrest me yeah, as yeah. a teacher. I don't think you do those things anymore. But we would yeah. do that. But I wanted to give them opportunity to see life outside of what they knew. Yes. Some of these kids never got outside of their neighborhood, yes. but I think it was just a matter of the the modeling that they they've seen us, and then when opportunity presented itself to them, yes. that hey, if you see that and encourage them, you know, yeah, you can you can do that, yeah, because if you don't, especially if it's something like my son with the um, Black Male Initiative, yes. I said you can't wait for someone else to do what you want for you. Yes. If you see the need and it's impacting 
someone that looks like you, sounds like you, feels like you, you have to get out at the forefront. You can't wait for other people to do it because it may never get done. Very true. And so I think that's uh, the model. I think they've just seen us doing that, you know, volunteer when they were small, going out to the track. Uh, volunteering as coaches, being out there with them, running around, you know, but seeing that we're putting in this time without expecting a paycheck or uh, helping people, bringing people food, giving yes. people a place to stay, different things. And I think that they've seen that in the modeling um, and that that's what, um, you know, because they've always had to, you know, you know, that's how they got where they were to get out there and do stuff for themselves. Yes. But also, how do you take other people along with you? How do you be a team player? How do you make sure that you're not the only one benefiting? Yes. And um, that, you know, they've had some some hard tests on that at times, you know, as well. I remember um, the twins were at a high school in Virginia um, and. Uh, they had already taken their state test, yes. but they were um, honors, honor roll. They were past honor roll. They were AB, AP honor students, really high GPAs. And, but they had a low black male count and they were like, um, we need y'all to retake it in this area. And they were like, well, we did ours already. And they wanted them to retake it. So my kids go in there and they take it, but they're doing Christmas trees and all kind of other stuff. And what? then they come back, you know, your kids did tr Christmas trees and, all of these things, and we needed them to be serious. <laughs> and I'm like, and they're like, but mom, we did this test already, they're only doing that so they can get their numbers. Yes. But I said, I understand where you're all coming from, but this is where, you know, this you're looking at the school, and you're not doing it for them, you're doing it for hopefully that it will benefit young black men. Yes. I know it, it also uh, skews things, but, you know, that was a hard lesson for them. So they did go back in, they, they, they sacrificed, and went back in, took the test and did it correctly. But at first they were really mad. But I said sometimes, and you don't want to burn bridges. Yes. And if it's something that you can help that might help someone along the way, and maybe the funding might come in better because you all showed up Absolutely. and did it. Maybe there's some way to, uh, and so when you talk to them about that, then they better understand it. But, you know, just someone coming and say, hey, you got to do this because we tell you to. They needed a, you know, they need a concrete answer yes. on why. Mm -hmm. now, now, Doc, now I, I know that just recently um, mm -hmm. uh, I was I was reading on Facebook where uh, the Princeton Theological Seminary just mm -hmm. hired what I think is their first African-American president to, yes. to lead the, the Divinity School. Are you are you having plans to meet with him? Um, not yet. I'm finishing up a course there. Oh my God. So you already... <laughs> I'm, I'm in a, a symposium, but I do plan because my current job with the Navy yes. is I am the, the, um, chaplain program, um, chaplain program officer yes. for diversity, equality, equity, and inclusion, yes. the DEI. So I, I do chaplain recruiting. Yes. And so, yes, I need to connect with, and so that's one of my plans before uh, this next week, what? I saw that the other day and I wrote it down yeah. and I said, I need to send my information and the person who is following up, yes. uh, who's taking over my position so that they might have to connect to be able to get connected to Princeton even more than yeah. they are, than we are. So yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> I did see that yeah, the other so, day, but so, that's my job is yeah. to connect with the seminaries around the nation. Yes, sir. Wow. So what I, I need you to do me a favor and I'm putting this on the record. Once you, okay. once you meet with the president, I would love to take him out to lunch, to dinner and, uh, okay. and, and certainly invite him to the, to the platform. But here's my, but here's my real question, right? Here's my real question for you. Uh, do you think that the arc of understanding in terms of how black folks celebrate their Christianity, is that going to increase now because there's a, there's a, there's a black president? Um, I w let me say it like this. I hope so. However, comma, in my job currently, yes. Um, Culture and tradition still reigns heavy. Yes. Say it like that. However, because we see this change, this is a major change, especially at a major university, Ivy League school. Oh, yes. This can light up the path, put a, 
a path, a, a light along the path of someone who had not even considered going to seminary yes. that maybe this is the time because there's change because, or someone who has applied before and has been turned down and thought it was because of who they were. Yes. But maybe this again uh, uh, echoes to them that signals to them that here's an opportunity. Let's try again. Yes. We, we, you know, the culture and traditions may be in place or, now maybe there. This is the opportunity that a lot of, lot of the culture and traditions are being uh, changed, yes. shattered, mitigated, getting out of the way. And so now, maybe now there's new opportunities for blacks to take up this, uh, take up the mantle at Princeton yes. and at some of the other seminaries where we're now in 2022, the first time yes. an African American yes. or or a female is now the president. Yes. of the school or dean even the dean yes. of the school of divinity yes yeah. when i mm -hmm. when i saw that i don't know if i if i got excited obviously i did <laughs> but my mouth yeah. dropped because like you i'm saying man <laughs> this is princeton theological Center yeah. <laughs> yes, in princeton, new jersey so this is what a huge disruption <laughs> this is what a yes. huge disruption looks like because now it's not like he says uh please allow me to come and be the president no the the board had to say yes. I, the board had to say I think there's time for a change yep. and I think that time we, for a change and so and so obviously I I I'm liking their understanding because I I would yes. love to see more of their I guess their, their I guess their students do ministry mm -hmm. in the urban area and now that we've got a, yes. black, a black president what does that look like in terms of them doing urban ministry now right Yes, wow. exactly. Wow. Yes. Wow. And, and, so that may open ooh, up some doors and yes. connections. Yes. Those who connect as he's connecting to yes. the big part of his job or the, I'm sorry, the president's job is to connect with the community yes. around them. Yes. And so hopefully that is going to show forth in the black community yeah. in black churches yeah. in um, ministry, urban ministry, as you have said. Yes, yes, sir. Because, because one of the, one of the challenges with urban ministry, and you know this already, pastor, is yes. funding and then yeah. <laughs> also trying to deal with the various levels of tra trauma that we come to the table. Yes. <laughs> Man, oh, but, yeah. This, you, you know, mm -hmm. when, we, when we come to the table or to the church every Sunday, it might be a new trauma on top of a new trauma, right? That's and, right. And, and, not mm -hmm. to, and not to even mention the social ills and the infrastructure ills that we bring to the table that we're also praying for God to, to, to remove us from. Right. So, wow. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yo, this prolonged grief. Yes. I am, so, prolonged grief. I am mm -hmm. so excited that he can now Wonderful. take up this mantle and see what, and see what does, what does this whole area look like under his guidance now in terms spiritually? Wow. Yes. I, I'm excited. Okay. Exactly. Now, I'm excited too. <laughs> now, I want to, I want to take like a, a two minute break uh, doc. But I want to ask this question, and, and hopefully you'll play along with me. Okay, here we go. Yes, sir. Now, every pastor that has ever been at uh, St. Paul AME Zion Church could always sing. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> what, <right? laughs> okay. okay. Well, you know, change occurs. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so much for that one. Okay, <laughs> because I I know every pastor that's ever been at St. Paul Amy Zion, they could sing. So I understand, Pastor. Yes. Right? Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Now, now, that's let, funny. Uh -huh. so let me let me ask this question. Right, so here you are in in downtown, well, not downtown Trenton, but you're you're in Ewing right. Township. Yes, sir. What is your ministerial call? I, I mean, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, if that if that makes sense, how mm -hmm. how are you bringing your congregants more to Christ? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, we're uh, it's interesting. We just finished having vision casting for the church. Yes, and um, our our vision is transforming hearts. By love, faith, and evangelism. Yes. And I believe the strongest ministry in our church is our class leader system, our small group system. Yes. And so we're emphasizing that because the goal is virtually or in person as this hybrid church that we have to get our members and the community connected, encouraged, and informed. 
They need to be connected to God yes. and connected to one another, encouraged by the word of God and encouraged by one another to follow the commandments of the word of God and live in accordance with God's word yes. and to be informed about the things of God and informed about what's going on in our community yes. around us. And so that connection is one that we're really working on. That is like one of the biggest things we're working on currently is getting connected to uh, the people in our community because the church was closed down yes. prior to my getting there for the, during the pandemic. So now we're back in person since um, Palm Sunday in April. Yes. And so people have been coming back and coming back. But what we need now is to reintroduce ourselves to because, the community has changed some yes. and some people have gone and some people have come. And so we're trying to connect to the community, connect to those who are in the seats, the yes. dignitaries to yes. let them know who we are, because that helps us to make sure we are doing the most for our, for the um, citizens in the Ewing area yes. to know the talking with our assembly person, talking with the mayor, talking with everyone. And especially those who are, um, seeking to be elected, that we hear what they say, and if they're telling us and making promises, our expectation is for them to carry it out. Yes. And so being connected to them, they know we are serious and that we know them and that, um, you know, that is important. So we're spending a lot of time, we have a Harvest Festival coming up, that we are trying to bring the community in to be back at St. Paul, to, yes. to see us in action as we continue to go out. And we're doing things like Food deserts are still a thing. Yes. A lot of people kind of feel like the pandemic is over, but people are still needing food. And so every other Saturday, we're giving out food like crazy. And sometimes we we uh, it it goes so fast. That's yes. the number of people that still need assistance in that way. And yes. we're, we have tons of boxes and bags and stuff. And then 20, 30 minutes later, they're gone. So we're trying to improve even those resources so yes. that we can even impact people um, more and more. And so uh, we're trying to do those things. Um, we're looking at veterans. Yes. Uh, we have, we're starting our Veterans of Faith ministry, a new ministry there, so that, because there are a lot of veterans in our community and we want them to have the resources that are available through the VA. We yes. want them to know that they are valued and we appreciate their service that they have, have given for this country and for our freedom. Yes. And so we're starting up this ministry and trying to acknowledge them. But we're also trying to get back to our young people awesome. um, because they are our future. And how do we get them strong and to be good citizens yes. and to be um, God-like creatures? And, and things. so we, we, we're working on how do we get um, do ministry for them that uh, bring uh, that, that, that attracts them, that's meeting their needs, that keeps them engaged um, and that brings their parents to take on that responsibility to make sure that they're in the places uh, they need to be or that we are aware of what their needs are, because that's a big part of uh, ministering to children and youth. Yes. So um, our big, those are the major focuses, and, and, and we're doing it by learning to be a church that is transforming hearts by love, faith, and evangelism. So we're doing a lot of teaching on yes. how to be a fruitful congregation, I how to be it. a totally forgiven congregation. Um, you know, how we'll talk about how to evangelize, how to, you know, so we do a lot of training, but that small group, the classes are our basis for doing all of that. Cause as we get our smaller groups strengthened, they're yes. able to now go out and do um, effective things. Cause they all each small, we have 11. And they each do two outreach projects a year. So yes. them coming together and figuring out what's needed in a community, going out, finding out what's needed and carrying out these projects to impact our um, community so that people are connected, encouraged and informed. Now, now, now doctor, I, I, I thank you for sharing. But as you were talking, three things, mm -hmm. three major questions came to my mind. And so just allow mm -hmm. me for a second. Oh yes, definitely. one of the one of the things that I'm I'm noticing that in 2022, uh, a lot of our black men are having this challenge of finding work mm -hmm. because of you know past mm -hmm. prior records, right? Mm -hmm. Is your church doing anything uh, for the reentry community? So I want you to hold that thought. But then, as I was mm -hmm. thinking of asking you that question, I was thinking, wow, 
if the the president of the Princeton Theological Seminary could embrace this as one of his goals, right? What would mm-hmm. that look like that all the ministers uh, or any student coming out of PTS would have that understanding that the community suffers so much because mm. of the social injustices uh, have been levied upon the black and brown community. What would it look mm. like if there was an extra course talking about ministering to those who are re-entering into our community? Oh. And so yes. I've got a I've got a, a friend of mine, dear friend of mine, two mm-hmm. two buddies of mine. Uh, and I'm probably going to mess up their titles, but it's going to be okay. And I'm going to introduce you to them at some point. It's uh, my brother, uh, Pastor Sam Atchison, Reverend Sam Atchison, who did a lot of work here with uh, a now defunct organization called Team, which was the Trenton Ecumenical Area Ministry. And he mm-hmm. was instrumental in doing a lot of outreach, but also he was also interest, uh, instrumental in doing a lot of work with reentry. And then he has mm-hmm. a, a buddy of him, a buddy of his uh, and mine as well, uh, Howard du- uh, Dean Trulier. And I believe he is the dean of the Howard University uh, School of Divinity. Mm-hmm. And he travels the country right. doing a lot of work with we- reentry. So I would, I mm-hmm. would love for you guys to meet and I would love for them to be able to meet yes. with the, the president of Princeton Theological Seminary and see what that looks like as they now realign and refocus to come back out because you know a, a lot of times you know as as you as you know as a minister mm-hmm. you're in the community and they come to you for guidance and wouldn't it be nice to say as i'm offering you you know food mm-hmm. i can also offer you classes i can also offer you opportunity mm-hmm. i can also offer you forgiveness at the level of being a re-entry person and this is how the yes. and this is how the church and the community are going to circle back around to to undergird your coming back into the community. So I, I, I love it. So th- that, that's all. Mm-hmm. Now, now back no, to- no, that's a <laughs> great point. No, that's a great question. And um, some uh, definitely an area, um, we currently do not have a ministry yes. uh, for reentry. However, um, and I just did a work, uh, attended a workshop just recently because um, we talk about families of incarcerated victims yes. and reentry. Yes. And a lot of times we forget and even just um, the, the the families of incarcerated people need a type of, of need ministry as well yes. because there's that shame and guilt that people carry that they have a member of the family yes. that might be incarcerated and we have to help relieve them of that burden that they have to feel that way but also making sure those who are incarcerated continue to know that they're valuable people. We're working on getting our um, church 501c3 together. Oh, yes. And so that presents opportunities. And I have other, I have five other ministers at my church. Yes. And so we're looking at what is, and, and so that's another need in the community. What is that need in the community? So this also presents opportunity, but making those connections, as you have pointed out, with like Princeton, um, the president of Princeton Theological, but these other, um, the other uh, contacts you have, that we can might come together yes. and pull together something that we can do to be an effective um, program in the Ewing Trenton area. Cause we know there's a lot of um, uh, jails and prisons in that oh, just right, oh, right yeah. around the corner from my church. Yes. And so, no, that is a viable program. I used to do some stuff like that. And when I was out in Compton, California, we had uh, some ministries where we would take care of and make sure uh, people who were incarcerated and, and um, reach out to their families and yes. stuff. But we do not currently at St. Paul, but there is always opportunity. And I see now when I hear about it and I hear that there's context for me to connect with, yeah, yeah. There, there, there lies the opportunity for us to do so. so yes. yes. Now, um, before we wrap up this conversation, which has been mm-hmm. wonderful, uh, mm-hmm. are, there, are there any, well, I know that there are, what have been some of the challenges within your ministry so far? Hmm. The challenges in my ministry. So I, I tell God is good and yes, I feel <laughs> oh, awfully overly blessed, especially because I have a part partner in ministry with my husband yes. and we, we were able to do ministry together. Um, the biggest challenge I, um, as I mentioned earlier, I am offering myself as a candidate for bishop in the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. And currently we have, we do not have any female leadership, women leadership 
as bishops or as general officers. Yes. And I ran the last time, and but this time I'm not holding back that we have to, uh, the challenge is people questioning the experience, the knowledge of, um, and qualification of women as leaders. And, and uh, we have a lot of strong women uh, in our church. And I'm not running just as the only woman to be elected. I, I desire that our church elect women into leadership. Yes. And so we have to start, we have to get rid of these arguments and uh, these uh, questioning whether women are ready to lead in the church yes. and that we now recognize, look at us, ask us questions, get to know us and find out our background so that they are aware of who we are and not making um, decisions just because of my, my, um, my gender. Yes. And so um, I'm, that, that is a big thing that is on my plate because I, I feel that in our church that um, women have the women leadership have not been uh, uh, as we see not having current women leadership that we need to um, elect women and we might, must do it as women as bishops as bishops period and make it a normal thing normalize the conversation about women leaders and I have special questions directed more towards women leaders that we don't towards. A male leader. So that has been the, if I have a challenge yes. in my church, that has to be the biggest challenge. I love people yes. and I could work with just about anybody. I feel that um, people may offend me, but I cannot offend others. Yes. And so I take that to heart. And, but my, my job is that Jesus has called me and two is that I take care of his people, love them. And in spite of uh, any differences we may have, yes. I know that my number one thing is to get everybody to the pearly gates so that I met yes. you or not. Yes. And so no matter what, I'm going to continue to do that, but I'm going to continue to do it as my authentic self. Yes. And so, you know, but, that, but that's my biggest challenge. Uh, otherwise, by faith, God has just been fulfilling um, the mission. You know, there's going to be some little challenges and uh, um, dis disagreements. But when we, when I lead as a faithful leader and, and the people take up the vision and follow me to, as I follow Christ, yes. oh boy, we get a ton of things done. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. and, I, and I guess the final fun question, uh, Pastor, uh, any mm -hmm. shout outs you want to give while we're on this platform? Any shout outs you want to give to anyone? Oh, well, shout out, first of all, to my, uh, to you and then just thank you uh, for this opportunity and thank, uh, and a shout out to Dr. Alberta Jones yes. for recommending me. I love my sister yes. and shout out to my husband, my yes. sweetheart, my number one supporter and to my family and my friends. And a big shout out to St. Paul AME Zion Church, the Camden District, the New Jersey Conference and the Northeastern Episcopal District led by Bishop Dennis Burns Proctor and Missionary Supervisor D. Diane Proctor and my um, presiding elder, Reverend Dr. Leticia Hill, Gadet. But I thank you and um, just uh, are excited about this opportunity and really appreciate you taking the time to have me on today. This has been wonderful. Listen, when uh, Dr. Jones gives me marching orders, I've got to march. And so <laughs> you, you have not, you have not, you have not, you have been nothing but remarkable remarkable and I, I you know what let's end on a fun a very fun note let's just put our hair down okay and let's just really have a good time here we go amen you ready you ready doc here we go yes sir yes sir yes we are we are making a movie of your family now, uh -huh. who is going yes, to play sir. The, who's going to play the part of your husband who's going to play the part of my husband yes. morris chestnut all right <laughs> <laughs> and who's going to and who's going to play the part of you, Doctor? Oh, if she would become an actor, Ms. Michelle Obama. Michelle Obama. <laughs> <Actress. right, all laughs> <right. laughs> and what would be the title of this movie? Uh, we crazy, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. The Reverend Dr. <laughs> Melanie Miller, thank you, thank you, thank you. One more time, the Reverend Dr. Melanie Miller, thank you, thank you, thank you. You have been a blessing. We have had a blast, and so I thank yes. you. I thank you. No, you're welcome, sir. Reverend. Thank you, and God bless you yes. uh, in all you do, sir. Thank you so much. So let's let's stay connected. Let's talk in text, and uh, we'll yes. stay connected. Yes, sir. Okay, bless you. Thank you so much. Have a blessed day. <laughs> 
You too. Bye bye. That concludes another episode of the Entrepreneurial Enclave with Kevin Wortham. The podcast that focuses on building, maintaining, pivoting, planning, and investing in you, the entrepreneur. We hope you found this episode informative and enlightening. If you have any questions or comments about any of our episodes, please call 609-731-9311 or email Kevin at minding-our-business.com We look forward to joining us for our next one. Until next time.